If you will kindly stand those who are able as I read God's word. Reading from the uh, book of Isaiah, the sixth chapter. In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him were seraphims, each with six wings, with two wings they cover their faces, with two they cover their feet, and with two they were flying. And they would call one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of the voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe unto me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I, have lived, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my lips have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphims flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. And with it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched my lips, your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. He said, go and tell these people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the hearts of, the, of these people clouds, make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, for how long Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitants, until the houses are left desert, deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged. And until the Lord has sent everyone has far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as it turn birth and oak leaves stumps when they were cut down. So the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Then reading from the book of the Gospel of Luke, the fifth chapter. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gesenset, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a, 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 a little from shore. Then he sat down and told the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let, the, and let down the nets for catch. Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't taught it, caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the cache of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the son of Zebedee, Simon's partner. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid from now on, for you will, will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, let everything, and follow him. This is God's word. Let's pray. Our Father, we're grateful to you for your word. And we pray, Lord, that as we have heard, that you would help our ears, Lord, unstop them. Father, illumine 
our eyes and enlighten our hearts, Lord, so that our blood boils with white hot affection for you and what it is that you're doing. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You've heard the expression, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And this is so often seen as an injustice. I recall in my own experience seeing guys get promoted to a position simply because they were friends with the boss. Or someone kept their job even though they underperformed because they were friends or they were family members with the boss while another person lost their job for underperforming. And it feels, it feels unjust but it's all in who you know. But when it comes to life in Christ, it's not whom you know as much as it is by whom you are known. And in this matter, at this matter of who it is that knows you, you can be assured that God knows you far better than you know him. One of the things that people dislike about Christians is the talk about knowing God. Have you tried to tell people that you know God? They look at you funny. Oh, you must be holy. Are you holier than me since you know God? Yeah, talking about knowing God feels a lot like it's not what you know, but it's who you know. And it feels unjust to people. Who do you think you are that you talk to God? Can't I have the same right? But what if, but what if you talk to them about being known by God? See, that's more, that's more in line with an encounter with God. That's, what, that's more in line with the gospel. That's Peter's encounter with Jesus in, in Luke chapter 5. It's, it's Jesus coming into Peter's world, onto his boats, saying to Peter, I know you. Now I want to show you who I am. I want you to know me. Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. That's the title of the sermon, put out into the deep. And I'm using that as a metaphor for, for the encounter with Jesus and the depth of the change that it takes, that, it, that, that that's the outcome of meeting Jesus. So this morning, I want to talk, about, talk to you about, about that outcome of encountering Jesus. If Christ himself, if Christ makes himself known to you, you can't remain the same. He calls you to put out into the deep. And when you encounter Jesus, it's because he seeks you. He catches you. Then he teaches you and releases you. Look at the text. Look at Luke 5, 1 through 3. Jesus seeks you. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing the nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. See, before there's an, an outcome, there's an encounter. And the encounter begins with Jesus seeking you. See, Jesus deliberately comes to Simon's boat. He particularly calls him out. I mean, the crowd is, is pressing. People, people are, are, are there. And, but Jesus calls Peter out. Jesus seeks you. That's the humbling and great truth to learn. If, you're, if you are to know the one by whom you are known, you didn't seek him first. He sought you. Psalm chapter 14, verses 2 through 3 says this about, about fallen humanity. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not 
even one. So no one seeks God. As Psalm 53, R- Romans 3 tells you the same, tells us the same thing. The scripture teaches that no one seeks after God. And you might say, but I know people who seek, who are seeking after God. How is that possible if no one seeks after God? Well, if anyone, if anyone is seeking after God, it's because God has sought them first. He calls and his people respond. Listen to Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. The Lord, seekers are sought. The Lord initiates the search. Before there are encounters with Jesus, Jesus is seeking you. Did you notice, too, that Jesus knows right where you are, that he comes to you on your job? He comes, and it seems he has no regard for the hard work that you've been doing. And Peter, he's been laboring all night trying to catch fish. Jesus comes, and he, he stops. They're cleaning their nets. He stops them from cleaning their nets and asks them to take their, take their nets and, their, and take the boats back out. What for? So he could preach. You can imagine, you know, if I showed up on your job and say, listen, can I borrow your, your workspace for a minute? What for? So I can preach. I wonder if Peter, I wonder if Peter stayed awake. I mean, they, they had to be tired because those nets aren't small and, and the, the boats aren't little. I mean, they're tw- they were 27 feet long and, and seven feet wide. And there's, there's an image of a, of a first century fishing boat that was an archaeological find a few years back. But, uh, so, so moving them around is a chore. And yet Jesus seeks them and says, let just put out for a little. He seeks them because he knows them. Jesus knows where you work and he knows your name. And he says, Simon, put out a little from the land. Simon offered none of the objections that I raised, you know, but that perhaps some of us would have made. And when Jesus speaks to those he knows, they respond. You see, the Bible teaches in John chapter 10, verse 14, is Jesus talking, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, my own know me. And he goes on teaching about his calling to those he knows. He says in verse 25 and 28 of John 10, Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. You see, Christ's calling is effectual. God draws. Jesus calls his sheep here, and they come. Jesus' call never misses his target because he intends to catch you. This is point number two. Look at verse four through nine of Luke five. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, I'm a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. You see, those whom Jesus knows, he seeks. And those whom he seeks, he catches. And how does he catch Peter? He, the passage says he astonishes James and John and, and Peter. And the word, the word astonish means to render immovable, to be seized. Now, how were they rendered immovable? What seized them? 
Was it just the miracle of, of the large catch of fish? Peter, Jesus, Peter had earlier had seen Jesus heal his mother-in-law and previously in chapter 4. He knows about Jesus' power to do miraculous things, all the healings that took place and, and the demons that were cast out. You, you see that in, in chapter 4. But this time, he wants Peter to put out into the deep and to let down their nets for a catch. Jesus is now in Peter's element. Peter's world uh, was, was fishing. It was what he knew. And what does Jesus know about fishing? He's a carpenter. He wants to go, he wants us to go out during the day. Everybody knows you fish at night. But Jesus knows more than you. And in this we find, as the old Puritan John Owen says, God works in us and with us, not against us or without us. You see, has, has Jesus ever caught you by telling you to do something that you thought you already knew? You already knew about it, but he takes you out into the deep. And there you see the Lord in a different light. You see, the deep looks like what you're familiar with, but you find you're, you're in over your head. You find Jesus is, is, that he's much more than you thought. That he has more power than you knew. That he is, that he, that he is the superlative of all superlatives. That, there is, that there, he's completely other. No one is like him. And you find that Jesus, yeah, the, that, the, that the more you discover your sinfulness, you're, that you're more sinful than you know, at the same time, you're more loved than you deserved. See, Jesus' holiness and, and his, his glorious grace renders you immovable, caught. See, that's what happened to Isaiah. He, he, he was... He, he, he knew about going to the temple. He was used to going to the temple. He was familiar with the workings of the temple. He was a prophet after all. But then one day he went to the temple and the last person he expects to see shows up, God. In, in Isaiah 6, 1, the passage says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. See, Isaiah... He knew about going to the temple, but why is it that he didn't? Why is it that it's now he sees the Lord? Because he was used to seeing King Uzziah. He loved the king. He loved the prosperity under the king. He loved his nation. But when King Uzziah died, the familiar was removed and the Lord was present before him. He was out in the deep. And Isaiah was caught, and he says it in, in, in verse 5 of chapter 6, Woe is me, for I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips. The people's lips are unclean too. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. But then the angel takes a burning hot coal from the altar and touches his mouth and tells him his guilt is taken away your sin atoned for. I see, yeah, see, that is what often happens. The familiar and what you think you know can often block you from seeing the Lord. But Jesus catches you, using what you think you know to call you out, to put out into the deep, to give you a fresh vision of himself showing you more of his glorious grace. In 1998, I called it a year of losses you know, for, for my family and I, but, but the reality is that right, that, that, that year was the beginning of, a, uh, of gains, and I gained so much more. Now, I won't tell you what all the losses were, but one of them was being rejected by a church that we had labored in with people we loved and served alongside for 14 years. And we left that church discouraged and, and wounded. We visited a few churches. 
one particular church that, that had had a relationship with the, with the pastor over, over the years, he wanted us to come and, and to join their denomination, but we didn't, we didn't think that the Lord was calling us there. Connie wasn't feeling that church, and I wasn't really feeling it either. And then we visited New City Fellowship, and we knew some folks there. We knew Randy and Joan neighbors, and Connie and the boys, they, they, were, they, were, they were liking it, and, and, I, was, and I, I was liking it as well, but, but I was wondering, what is there for me to do here? I mean, it's, it's a church that had a lot of Covenant College professors. There were already three pastors on the staff. You know, what, what am I going to do here? There were retired missionaries. I mean, all, all of this, was, they had all of this that was, that was going on. You know, but I, I, I thought, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't let what I knew to be the determining factor for where we would go to church. And neither of us, we didn't want the boys to have a negative church hopping, I mean shopping experience. Little did I know though, that God would use that time. For, two, for nearly two years, I, I, I sat and, 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 and I, just, I just heard the, the message of grace, the doctrines of grace, washing over my wounded heart and, and, and it began to melt my heart and fire up my soul with a renewed passion for the gospel. I saw the Lord anew. He took me out into the deep. You see, encountering Jesus, there's an unselfing of ourselves. And Jesus catches you and, and puts you puts you out into the deep because there he teaches you. Look at verses 9 and 10. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken, and so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. You see, you encounter Jesus because he seeks you and catches you. Then he has much to teach you. And it begins, as with Peter, by addressing your fears. See, Jesus teaches Peter about his fears. Peter, he's fallen at Jesus' knees and, and pleads with the Lord, depart from me because he's a sinful man. Can you relate? But Jesus doesn't tell Peter, your sins are forgiven. No, he says, do not be afraid. Now, why would he tell Peter this? You know, the Greek word there is not a word for, for reverence. It's not a word, you know, it's not a word for, for that, that would be a use for the fear of the Lord, but it's a word from which we get our word, phobias. See, Jesus knew Peter's fears. Putting out into the deep exposes your fears. And Peter would have a lot of phobias come up in his life. This wasn't the only one. Peter will learn the more we know of our sin and the more we know of Jesus, the more we will turn to him. You see, when Peter is, when, when Jesus is arrested, Peter is afraid of a little girl who said, weren't you with them? There are a few others who said the same thing that, that, that day, that evening, and, but Peter denies it three times. He denies that he knew Jesus. In Acts chapter 10, he has a fear of eating unclean food. Remember he had the dream and the Lord has to tell him that whatever he, he has called clean, you're not to call it unclean. And it turns out it wasn't, a, it wasn't about food, it was about people. It was, it, and, and, and the Gentiles particularly, as he being a Jew, he didn't associate with Gentiles. God, Christ has to address his fears. And then in Galatians chapter 2, is, is Peter, he's afraid of some brothers who came up from Jerusalem. He feared what they would think if they smelt bacon on his breath after hanging out and kicking it with some Gentiles. See, and Paul, Paul rebuked him. And, and here, here's the reason Paul rebukes him. Listen to, to what he says in Galatians 2.14. But when I saw 
that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, another name for Peter, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like a Jew? See, the gospel, scripture teaches, isn't reinforcing fear-driven segregation of the ethnicities. But it is growing, it's, it is growing a love-driven community pursuing ethnic reconciliation. Peter, they weren't walking in that. Peter, and he, t- he had Barnabas go right along with him. And Paul said, no, no, no. That has to stop. Peter was fearing cultural pressures from these influential Jews from Jerusalem. They came, he withdrew from the Gentiles that he had previously been enjoying a slice of bacon or two with. You see, segregation still happens in churches in, our, in, in, in this country. That should stop. That hurts the gospel. Thankfully, thankfully there, historically, we see that there are times in our history where, 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 where people, men and women, addressed this, their bright spots, conquering their fears through the power of the gospel in pursuit of the healing of the ethnicities. Like the story in your order of worship this morning, the story about how Lincoln University got started. Lincoln University is right up the road if you don't know that. He, but, but here this Presbyterian minister he, who, who founded the university took his resources and, and he and his wife started a school and listen how what they said, the, how, why they started school. is for the scientific, classical, and theological education of color youth of the male sex. We don't use the term colored anymore, you know, but that, back then that was, that was a common cultural uh, uh, reference. You know, but but he said, this was the reason why they started it. Lincoln University is one of the oldest HBCUs in our country. What fears, what fears do you have? You know, it, it, it that it is completely appropriate to bring your fears even to worship, even in worship. When you, that, that all of these, that you bring these fears and you lay them before Jesus because he knows you more than you know yourself. And in grace, he says to you and I, do not be afraid. And no doubt Peter's sins were forgiven, But Jesus also teaches him that he alone aids him in overcoming his fears. Because listen, you're not not free if you are filled with fear. So therefore, when encountering Jesus, he releases you. Look at verse 11. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. See, now, this is the part of the story that is probably where most people today would, would be ready to abandon ship. We see Peter and James and John, they, they leave their business to follow Jesus. I said earlier, you cannot encounter Jesus and remain the same. See, whatever your fear was before, encountering Jesus will displace it. That's what was happening to Isaiah in Isaiah 6 when he saw that, that, the, that the train of Israel, all the power and the, the authority and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. There was no room for anything else. It displaced everything. And whatever was your fear before, encountering Jesus will displace it. Jesus displaced their fishing business. He displaced their source of income. How will they explain what happened to their families? Yeah, I can hear the story, Peter telling his wife how how Jesus took them out into the deep during the daytime. But I left it all to follow him. We these fish, our nets were breaking, the boat was about to sink, but we left all of it to follow him. He did something more than give me fish. He knew me. He knew my sinfulness. And he forgave me and told me, do not be afraid. I will make you a fisher of men. James and, and John going home and, and telling their mother, you know, what, what, what was done? We, we were, we're done with fishing. We're following Jesus. Jesus has promised to make us 
fishers of something more valuable, that we're catching people. We saw the king who can command fish to fill our nets and, and remove our sin and guilt, and we are sure he is in, he, that he will enable us to fish and catch men. You see, encountering Jesus transforms our fears in, into a, a glorious freedom whereby we follow Christ without reservations and conditions. You see, Jesus releasing you means you have to rely on him in the deep. You can't trust what you used to know. You left that to follow him. See, putting out into the deep, there's always a breaking down of the, of the confidence in yourself, in your church, in, in your culture rather, in your institutions. Christ is always breaking them down until you and I are serving him without reservation or conditions until he is Lord. That's what Isaiah 6.13 is all about. It pictures this. And if you remember the text, it says, and though a tenth remains in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled, the holy seed is its stump. Everything is taken away. See, Jesus is that holy seed. He's this, everything else is stripped away. It's taken away. It's laid waste. It's desolate. It's thrown out until the only thing that remains is the holy seed. You see, the Lord will take you down to where the only thing left is Jesus. Put out into the deep. Lower your nets for a catch. You say, how do you know that Jesus has released you? How do you know that? Well, the way you know, the way you know that Jesus has released you is when you obey him without conditions. He releases you. But it doesn't mean he isn't with you. Because if Jesus has sought you, he's caught you, and he's taught you, and he released you to follow him, what would make you think that he will abandon you now? The scripture tells us he lived for us. He lived for you. He died for you. Why would he leave you? You remember? He came into our world. He became one of us. The scripture says, so that he might taste death for all of us and destroy him who had the power of death and to free those who all of their life long were held as slaves to the power of death. So as you follow him, it's always good to remember that to know where it is he's leading you. Where, where, where is he leading you? Well, he's leading, he's leading you into the ever-increasing and ever-expanding kingdom of God. He's leading into the, the, the unsearchable depths of both the riches and the knowledge of God. He's leading into comprehending a love that passes knowledge. Into a, a place where we are filled with all the fullness of God. He's leading us to that place where he has gone to prepare for us. He's leading us to the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Where the dwelling place of God is with men. He's leading us to the place where death is no more. Hallelujah. And mourning is over. Crying and pain are gone, and all the former things are passed away. Where the leaves of the tree of life is for the healing of the nations. That's where he's leading us. There's a lot more the places, things that where he is leading it. But since this is where Jesus is leading you, perhaps now you see why it is not so important who you know as much as it is by whom you are known. J.I. Packer has this very encouraging piece in his book, Knowing God. He, said, he writes this. He says, what matters supremely, therefore, is not in the last analysis, the fact that I know God, but the larger fact which underlies it, that he knows me. 
I am graven on the palms of his hand. I am never out of his mind. All my knowledge of him depends on his sustained initiative in knowing me. I know him because he first knew me and continues to know me. He knows me as a friend, one who loves me, and there is no moment when his eye is off me or his attention distracted from me, and no moment, therefore, when his care falters. This is momentous knowledge. There is unspeakable comfort in knowing that God is constantly taking knowledge of me in love and watching over me for my good. This is tremendous relief in knowing, there is tremendous relief in knowing that his love is, is utterly realistic, based at every point on prior knowledge of the worst about me, so that no discovery now can disillusion him about me in the way that I'm so often disillusioned about myself, and quench his determination to bless me. Hallelujah. That God knows you. Oh, my. Yeah. Yeah, that is, take great joy in that. Because if Jesus knows you like this, then you can put out into the deep. No matter what's out there, no matter what's in the, un, under the water, it doesn't matter. Jesus knows you and he is with you. Surrender all to Jesus. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, how great and glorious is your love for us and your grace toward us in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, what a hope it is that we have in him. Thank you for such a deliverance. Thank you for such love. Thank you that it never turns away from us. You never turn from us. Father, I pray that you would open the hearts and minds of those who don't know you, that may they hear your calling and be assured of you being present with them, learning of you. Lord, take us all out into the deep until we follow you alone. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.